What's up, Prime Fam? So workout walkthrough, we got Kristen's workout, my workout, I'm just gonna vlog and I'm actually gonna talk about what we're doing from a training standpoint, why we're doing it. Kristen's actually in the middle of a peak week, so we're gonna explain how we peak her for training, which is kind of unique to her. And then we're also gonna talk about my front squat, lower body hypertrophy day. So I got front squats today, trap bar deadlifts, I believe, and then a few other things. So we're gonna take you through the whole workout, explain why we're doing everything, why I chose the exercises I chose, why the rep ranges are where they are, and all that good stuff. We're gonna warm up some front squats here. Kristen's got some pause squats, and we'll take you through it all. Okay guys, so front squats today, we got three sets of eight at about RP five to six. It's week one, and I have loaded up 286 pounds because of the kilo plates. Uh, last training block, I had sets of 10, and my best sets of front squats were three sets of 10 at 285 pounds. So I'm basically matching that weight now for week one. So I always try to think in terms of progressions, and while I could probably technically hype up and try to move 315 or 305, for sets of eight a little bit easier. I'm trying to approach these sets very methodical, form first, and setting a precedent week one. That way, as I send through these next four weeks of this training block, I have room to improve week to week without the RP risking an overshoot. So it's not always about trying to match your RP perfectly. If anything, I think undershooting is not a bad thing if you're getting quality volume in, and as long as it's not grossly undershot, I'm gonna set myself up for progression. So set number one, I have a feeling this will be around RP four to five, we'll see. And then maybe I'll bump it up or I'll just keep it here and then we'll leave that room for progression from week to week. myself accountable this is highly undervalued I never let myself squat at barely depth like the last set I didn't like to look at the depth on some reps is very questionable I want to sink these stay mobile stay strong in end range positions never be a bitch don't be that guy who's afraid to sink their squats there's nothing worse than that or that girl squats for me on my secondary day. A lot of people might say, oh, that's really light for a second squat day. I am squatting three times per week. And on this day, the reason I'm doing front squats is I really want to prioritize a couple things. The first one is movement variability, giving my joints a break. I just came out of a meat prep, so my joints are really beat up. So the less load I can get with equal exertion, the better. So meaning I can make these you know, RP6 or seven or whatever it calls for and still challenge myself without having four or 500 pounds on the bar. Second reason, and probably more importantly, is uh, my upright squat pattern. So I'm someone who dumps a lot from their upper back or the quads in a squat. The way I have prevented that, and you would never guess from my squat technique, it looks pretty locked in. The way I prevented that is a lot of front squats and high bar squats and high bar pause squats. So I hammer these things in the off season, which is why my technique is so good. A lot of people might say, oh, you don't need things like this. This is how I created this technique. My squat form used to be trash until I started doing a lot of front squats. Thirdly, uh, I'm really proficient at these. So normally I might throw in front squats on a tertiary day, uh, something where it's a little less priority. So usually order of importance goes primary day, secondary day, tertiary day. Uh, my secondary day though, I'm proficient enough at front squats to use these and have enough load to still stimulate a lot of CNS and still kind of get something heavy enough on me to really produce momentum and strength gains over the training block. On a tertiary day where it's a little less important, someone might do better with front squats 
when they're not as technically proficient with this movement and need to learn it. But that is the beauty of the front squat. When you do them, it teaches you to do a back squat perfectly. A lot of people, when they do their back squat, they come out of the hole and this tip like this happens and then you see the hips get back under. When I come out of the hole, I stay in this position. Why? Because I'm doing so many front squats that force you into that position. So the being forced into proper positioning is a great way to learn how to properly squat and keep your quads and hips in the game. And so if, even if you're someone who's still learning the front squat, it can be hugely beneficial to throw this on church here today, load it up, practice the movement, and get a lot of carryover from a technical standpoint, not even a weak point or hypertrophy standpoint, which is actually why I'm doing them. Cutie. Okay, so pause squats, you just did 176 pounds, I think that is, right? Yeah. Sets of four. So how are we tapering you into this, this uh, test day? What was your last week like, which was a very normal amount of training volume, and what's it, the difference this week? So last week and the weeks leading up to this week, um, I've been doing three sets of squats. Okay. Um, at around RP five to six. Gotcha. Um, but last three sets week, of pause squats, right? Pause so it's squats, been the same thing. Same gotcha. Thing. Um, however, it was sets of six. And so this week, week four, we dropped the amount of sets by one set and the amount of reps by two reps. So this week I'm doing four reps rather than six reps. Still around the same RPE. Um, so we're still getting the same amount of like exertion, uh, but less overall work, I guess. Yep. Less sets, less reps, um, and, and kind of kept we... the uh, intensity a little bit higher. Yeah, so which is important for you. Much, yeah. Because you detrain kind of quick. Now, yeah. what do we do on the deadlifts with you? Deadlifts? Because um, normally you deadlift your second day today, and that's what we should say too, is this is your uh, second squat and deadlift day of the week. So yeah. what do you do on, on deadlifts this week? Um, deadlifts we completely cut out. I think I was doing two or three sets, three sets of deadlifts, um, pause deadlifts, uh, the weeks prior, and then this week we cut them all out. So complete deload from deload. Uh, from Why deadlifts. do we remove all deadlifts but not squat? Um, deadlifts are just overall more taxing, and there's really no need to push extra volume during a deload for deadlifts, so uh, they don't really detrain either. Um, Definitely not. Yeah, you can go like a month without yeah, deadlifting and so, still pull something pretty good. Um, yeah, we typically, week four for deloads, we typically take out all deadlifts and then uh, feel fresh for the, the heavy day. Cool. Yeah. Okay guys, so done with this front squat, three sets of eight, so why, why such high reps? Last block was three sets of ten. The reason being is I'm training work capacity above all else, also hypertrophy. So more, more reps, we're gonna accumulate more total workload and volume, more mechanical tension. It's gonna stimulate more hypertrophy than if I did the opposite where I went heavier and less reps. And then uh, also just movement, technique, and practice. This sounds funny, but especially if you're responsible with your high reps, you get more chances every rep to practice your technique with a lighter load than trying to do something substantially heavy where it's a lot easier to misgroove. Light weights are easier to move well with. You just have to be responsible to not be lazy. Kind of like I checked myself with the depth and working on your rack position or whatever it may be. So let's talk about work capacity though real quick. This is the missing component in almost everyone's hype, uh, program where they get injured. So if you deal with injuries and if you deal with burning out before you get to your test day, like if you hit hella PRs and then like, three, four weeks out from your meter test day, you burn out, you're probably not keeping in enough work capacity uh, training and adaptation stimulus uh, in your program. So when I start these training blocks, I'm purposely trying to kill out my cardiovascular system. I'm purposely trying to make these energy demanding. Why? It builds more total work capacity, which allows me to handle more total workload deeper into the cycle. And I actually keep this in for a while. I never go more than two training blocks, so eight weeks, of doing very uh, you know, moderate to low repetition ranges. Even in this training cycle, I'm gonna keep in decently high reps at least on one of the days until about four weeks out. The reason being is that will allow my work capacity to stay really high so the rest of the work is a lot more easy to recover from. This kind of seems to contradict itself when you first hear this because you would think, oh, doing heavy weights is gonna be way more taxing than doing light weights. It's not the way it works. This is so energy demanding, and it's so demanding on the connective tissues, the, uh, the muscle, muscular system, and I don't mean in a bad way, I mean in a good way. We are training the connective tissues with tons of tonnage here. We're training the muscular system with tons of tonnage. We're training that mitochondrial and capillary density, that energy demand with tons of tonnage, and that equates to the rest of the work 
being easy breezy. So that's why we're doing it. Now we're moving on to trap bar deadlifts. I'll explain those here in a little bit. Kristen finished up her last set of squats. I'll let her kind of explain what she's doing for the rest of the workout too. If you're wondering why I'm grunting and talking so much so I don't get copyright. So trap bar deadlifts, why are we doing this exercise? What's the purpose? First of all, doing a trap bar deadlift from the high handles, but every trap bar is very different. Some high handles are way higher than others. What I want is for this bar to be lined up right around conventional deadlift height for me. I want it to mimic my conventional pull as much as possible. We don't want to go too much range of motion, otherwise it makes it very quad dominant unless there's a purpose as to why you'd be doing that. And what I'm really actually focused on is upper back and low back rigidity with a little bit of extra leg drive. That's the key for this. We're doing high volume here, giving my, bra ba my, bra giving my back a little break from the heavy weights and building the traps mid back like crazy because it's a wide grip. You're gonna get a lot of mid back work out of this, especially if you use a higher handle, a little bit more load on the bar. Going really light today, 464-ish pounds. If the bar's 45, I don't really know. It might be a little heavier. Uh, last time I did four red, so about 485. For sets of 10, week one, I'm feeling fried. So I'm just trying to go light, set a new baseline, recover a little bit, and then build week to week. As long as I'm beating last blocks week one, and eventually week four, I'm progressing. So that's the key, is just make sure you're beating yourself. It doesn't need to be linear, just because I'm doing eights instead of tens now, doesn't mean I need to throw on an extra, extra load, especially on week one. Training heavy, especially on secondary days, is a little overrated, to be honest. So what do you got set up there? Uh, belt squat on the cable machine. Oh, so, creative. creative. Did you build those plates yourself? Yes. I stacked them up myself too. <laughs> right before this session. That part is the real workout is stacking these plates. So she's going to be doing some belt squats here. Uh, goal here is just quad hypertrophy. Now, uh, are, are we reducing volume on these at all? Uh, by one set. One set. So the idea is to keep in stimulation still, especially since we're completely removing deadlifts and we removed one set of squats. We don't want to detrain your quads either, right? Right. So the way to look at it is small volume reduction, not very, very large, especially on, on people who tend to be smaller lifters. So females and smaller weight class guys, you're going to need to peak them a lot less than say a bigger male, especially one who's, you know, lifting three, four times body weight type stuff. This is crazy. This is my chastity belt. Chastity belt. <laughs> I'll figure out a way to break it. All right, doing some leg extensions now. You can see we got the home set up. We take a bench, stack it right in front, put the plate right below it, and then cable cuffs on the ankles, and boom, we got good leg extension. In fact, I really like the resistance curve here. While the range of motion is not quite as full as a really good leg extension machine, it's more full than the plate loaded ones, and the resistance peaks out at the right times, a little bit more smooth to where not all the tension's up top like a plate loaded one. So this actually works pretty well. You can see in her face, it is burning. There's the burn face. Ah. Okay, nice quads. So I try to really sit forward to allow my foot to go as far back as I can. And the only problem is this damn little thing is getting in the way, but I try to get as much flexion here. So the more this shin comes towards my ass, the more flexion I can get. And then we get more total range of motion. The plate loaded ones are trash because at the top, there's a ton of tension and down here there's like nothing. This is gonna have a better resistance curve than if I bought one of those cheap plate loaded leg extensions. Now obviously, those selectorized plate loaded 
leg extensions that are not plate loaded, uh, cable loaded uh, leg extensions at the commercial gyms are better than this, admittedly, but obviously we don't have access to that. These still burn like a motherfucker though. So doing some hamstring curls here, same kind of idea, cable resistance, going real slow and controlled on contraction. You gotta play with the heights on this one. This is actually probably a little notch too low. It makes the resistance almost minimal right here because nothing's pulling my foot down and back, resisting flexion. So I need the cable to be in the opposing motion of flexion, which at the bottom here it's not. So next set, I'm gonna raise the cable up one space, which will have my foot pulling from a different angle. So doing Copenhagen planks, this actually isn't on the protocol for today, but I'm gonna set these in for my ab exercise instead. This is a core exercise, your adductors, obliques, they work like a sling to synergize together in order to stabilize your core. So this is very core dominant. It's QLs, obliques, and adductors firing, and even actually passive glute med and uh, the other external rotators. But anyway, idea here is to stack the hips. So stack it, straight line, real tight. I go for my knee because I'm not good at these. My adductors suck. I'm trying to train them, keep me healthy, keep the core very long and tight, straight line with everything, <sighs> holding for about probably 20 seconds aside because to hold these into good position is really hard to me. <sighs> oh, <man. sighs> no sag, no hip sag. <sighs> and I gotta do both sides. That's plenty right there. <laughs> Most people do these wrong. They let their hips sag all over the place. Not here, we execute. So straight line, loop stack. Oh man. The second side's always so much harder because they're already dead. Both sides fire together. Oh shit. Okay. That's it for the vlog today. I hope you guys learned something. Like the video, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave a comment down below about how weak my adductors are. I'll see you guys in the next video.